Here we go. Right, so, in the context of occupiers, tenants, the companies, large companies generally, that actually occupy smart buildings. Um, these are companies with lots of bums on seats, hybrid workers, people coming and going. In those companies, who's actually responsible for actioning the insights that come from s smart building systems? I think we're all agreed here today, we don't need to dwell on it. There's huge potential benefits um, to workplace optimization from smart building data. But we're here to talk about return on investment. And we'll talk about things like energy, cost reduction, and um, sustainability. But it's difficult to think of or even imagine a more valuable ROI than our physical and mental well-being. And we all know that if we look after the well-being of our staff, that we'll have, we'll increase productivity, we'll reduce absenteeism, um, and we'll have increased employee retention. So just, actually I can't see a thing, but anyway, just by a show of hands, how many people here in the audience actually work in HR, in human resources? I don't think I see any. Okay, so I'm gonna assume, actually how many people are integrators? Like system integrators of some sort? Okay, there's a couple of okay. So, assuming a lot of you work in the smart building industry of some sort, and you either work for some of these companies I'm just talking about, or you're uh, uh, a contractor and you work for these clients. Within those companies, who do you report in? So what team do you report in those companies? I'm gonna start with uh, real estate or facility management. How many of you guys report into those teams directly or indirectly in your clients? Okay, I think I've got actually very little. Okay, what about IT? Okay, a good few more hands. And finally then, human resources again. What about finance? Okay, so here works, we work with some of the largest technology and financial, financial multinationals in the world, and we deliver insights to them via our Heroes Happy platform. But there's a common thread across them all. This is a weird AI image, by the way. But it's not, it, the common thread across them all is it's not always clear who's responsible for actioning the human-related insights that can really impact the well-being <coughs> of building occupants. So when we get to the smart building table, we always have real estate. We have real estate there because they want to see they can, how they can improve space utilization, uh, reduce real estate costs, and they also want some degree of standardization across their estate. FM, facility management, are there too, and perhaps, uh, depending on the organization, are a subset of real estate. But they're there because there's generally a physical install involved, um, and they also want to look at energy savings, sustainability, plant efficiencies. So they're always there. And in fact, it's usually one of those two that actually want a smart building in the first place. So they'll commission us. Then we have IT, because, well, there's... A lot of things are going to be connected to the network, to security concerns. We have workplace leaders. And what do we mean by workplace leaders? I mean the actual managers who are going to work in that space. The people who are concerned about what that space is actually going to be used for. And they're worried about practical things like how do we book a desk, lockers, that kind of thing. And then sometimes we have uh, workplace health and safety uh, at the table too. Um, although sometimes they can be reluctant to get involved because of some of the data that it might show up. But in reality, at the start of a construction project, new, brand new construction project, there's excitement, there's a big vision, and there's a massive capital budget. And everybody wants to get involved, and you know, I think we can all relate to this, and there's new technologies, and anyway, what's the building gonna look like in two years' time? And then we build the building and it's handed over to facility management. And now it's OPEX. And now it's a lean budget. And now it's about the efficiencies of operating <coughs> a facility management contract. And there's no room for proactivity because that's the way we've written these contracts. So 
when our platform here works happy identifies human centric insights, things like stuffy rooms, crowded tea stations, there's actually nobody there available to action them. So I'm going to give a little a few examples here. So here's one that resulted in impaired cognitive ability. This is a building in Dublin. Um, this was actually a series of rooms, they were called training rooms. Um, and our platform generated an insight saying there was major CO2 peaks in the training room and they lasted long periods and they were on successive days and it actually the insights went on because there was, there was more across the building. And we see, we see CO2 rising to nearly 2,300 parts per million. Now that's, that, that's horrible. That's approaching very unhealthy. You're going to be sleepy. It's going to be very hard to concentrate. It actually could cause health issues. And that went on for three or four hours during the day. Now, when we investigated it, we found that there was, we looked at the space occupancy data, there was 26 people in that room. The room was designed for 15 people. So we said, okay, let's just increase the air changes. We couldn't, that was the maximum we could do. So we spoke to facilities, they had commissioned us, and uh, you know, we spoke about what we could do, and there was a zero cost solution. There was bigger rooms available in the same building on the same day. So the solution was to just pick different rooms. But facilities didn't work with workplace. So they didn't really know, well, how do we... So that went on for weeks, possibly months. The next example is... Now, generally, actually, sustainability energy saving is fairly well represented at that smart building table. But here's an example of... This is another building, and we had... It was a particular section of the building and it was a series of rooms and this is actually in December just gone and we, we got an insight uh, from the system to say that there was these recurring temperature swings. There's an anomaly here in the temperatures and what this particular building, the HVAC was set to basically bring the rooms to temperature at 7am in the morning and that's what you see here. These are the peaks at 7am but they're up at 28 degrees and the rest of the building was running just fine, but this series of rooms was doing this. And then you could see that once the room became occupied, somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30 a.m., you can see this, it's a kind of an unusual curve after that, the temperature would be brought down from to about 21, 22 degrees. So what was actually happening was, somebody was coming into the BAMI 28 degree room, there was a controller on the wall, and they were turning it down. Now, they... Obviously, this is a huge waste of energy, and the obvious cause was that the BMS system was, was set incorrectly. Um, so we sought to write back to the BMS system. But facilities, this particular building, and I think we can all relate to this, a few people have mentioned this as well. This building was commissioned three years, it was handed over, sorry, and occupied three years previous to this, but the BMS system still has issues. And facilities really did not want to go tinkering around with the BMS system. So we said, well, do you know what? The sustainability team are here at, at the table too. So we talked to them and they were interested, but it was way too micro for them. They were interested in a much bigger picture. That's still going on in January. Here's another example of unhealthy conditions. Um, this is a particular room, there's about eight people working in it in the building. Um, there was a technical um, activity happening in it. And we started to see from the system that we were seeing TVOX spikes, 3,213 parts per billion, that's massive. TVOX, of course, is a group of compounds, so you don't know exactly what the compound, the, sen the sensors is to tell you what it is, but it doesn't look good. So we looked at this for a while, this was go again, this was going on over a period of months, we could never figure out, they spoke to the people in the space, didn't really know, the only suggestion was that it might be the cleaning, that there was a particular cleaning material they were using, so we did a spray test, that didn't come close to what the peaks we were seeing, there was no pattern to the data, so um, facilities were like, yeah, no, it doesn't look great, but to be honest, um, we're... Uh, I'm not getting any complaints about it. And workplace health and safety weren't involved. So here was the smart building data giving us some lovely data and we couldn't do anything with it. We needed to go in and actually find out what was the compound. Mm. Was it dangerous? What was it? I have my, my suspicions what it was. I think. The, 
this is an extract from uh, Solve. So here we're Solve is our smart ticketing system. We put these tags, they're location aware on different, um, on different assets around the building and you can report problems. This was a, a recurring issue um, over the period of a year. We've seen this recurring issue on desks. So the asset was desks and the recurring problem was cables missing. I think we can all relate to this as well. And what was happening was IT or F, I can't remember if it was IT or FM were getting the, uh, getting the reports and they'd go and they'd replace the cable. And then they replace the cable when it happens again. When we actually looked to investigate, what we found out was the docking station had the, you were able to plug the leads in at the front of the docking station. And it was quite easy to innocently take the cable thinking it was your own. Whereas in the rest of the building, there was a different type of docking station with kind of monitor based and you had to plug the cable in the back. But they kept fixing this problem, but not getting to the root cause. So again, the insight was about recurring issues. Obviously the solution was either to lock the cables or replace the docking station. But again, I've loads more of these examples. Uh, everything from queues at canteens, uh, constant re re recurring trends. Now don't shoot me right on this one. I upset a few people here last year, right? But did, uh, don't shoot the messenger. When I was researching for this keynote, I um, spoke to a, a head of workplace uh, in London and we talked about this problem and these are her words. She said, facility management ruin, through no fault of their own, all the hard work and expense of putting in these technologies and analyzing the data because they are just looking to reduce costs. So notwithstanding what teams are involved, it's still not clear who holds the overall respons responsibility for using these insights to get a return for our biggest ROI possible. And that's the well-being of our people. Focusing on costs and efficiencies and legislative requirements just doesn't cut it anymore. And even if my sole function is to increase shareholder value, it still doesn't make sense. Because healthy, comfortable staff are more productive. And that's a fact. So I question, why don't we see our HR colleagues at the smart building table? And I would hypothesize that HR should be at the top of that smart building table. After all, HR is all about people. So we've already demonstrated that we, around the table we have health and safety, we have workplace leaders, we have IT, we have the facilities team, we have the smart technology itself, and we have real estate. So what if we introduce human resources and the concept of a cross-functional team breaking away from the traditional silos that each of those teams work in? And now we have a framework which I've coined Swift HR. So Swift HR is a cross-functional team with agility. It's got quick responsiveness in managing smart building insights. It's like an innovation team, except every single item on the agenda is a win for the company. And the team just needs to agree an execution plan. It has to be agile, because a lot of these insights propose small iterative changes to the workplace that get overlooked on that grand scale. You see, HR are the ones with expertise in employee well-being. They've got expertise in change management across the company, fostering engagement with different initiatives. They understand legislation. They have a deep understanding of user needs. And they have a deep understanding of employer needs. And they're generally sufficiently uh, senior in the organization to actually affect change. HR should leave the Swift HR team and be ultimately accountable for actioning smart building insights with the human experience as their key KPI. HR are the ones who carry out surveys, they survey staff, they carry out sentiment analysis. And I would argue that all that data should also feed into the data layer or the data lake of the smart building. In fact, I'd argue that those sentiment analysis should be done via the smart building platform 
because then it's normalized at source. And we're putting the human right at the center of the data. HR can also ensure that no other stakeholders' needs or priorities outweigh that of the people who occupy the building. Because after all, in terms of an office building, that's the only reason the building exists, is for the people inside it. We could have a very efficient building if we didn't build it, or if we didn't heat it. But look, that's an extreme example, but you get my point. Facilities contracts are not connected to people. And again, putting my shareholder hat on, then they're not connected to productivity. <coughs> Couple this with giving occupants access to the smart building data, empowers them, and allows them to potentially improve their immediate surroundings with a smart building. Now, I'm not just talking about how busy is the canteen. I mean, that's great if I want to go down for a cup of coffee at half one. But let's be a bit braver. Do we give them access to everything? Do we give them access to, say, IEQ information, so internal environment quality? Because if we did that in my earlier example, if, if they knew the CO, their CO2 levels in the room, if they knew there was a recurring issue when there was too many people in that room, or they knew it was a noisy environment on that given day, they could go and choose to work somewhere else. Now, some of our clients are actually terrified of the idea of giving IEQ information to people because of the risk of litigation. But I'd argue that, doesn't that risk not exist anyway? Give people the choice and let them adjust their own work practices. Also, people want a choice now because like, we have such neurodiversity in our workforce now, we can't possibly expect to understand how everyone wants to work. So the workforce of today are the ones, as my colleague Dan, wherever he is, puts it, they give a shit. They want a purpose and a connection to their work. And they also want information on sustainability. Not just headlines of maybe 40 or 50 kilowatt hours of solar we generated on the roof today, but how are we actually tracking against what we said we would do, how's the building performing, what, what, what are our targets, are we meeting them, are we not? And what impact can they themselves have on it, no matter how small? I flew here to Barcelona yesterday, and when I was booking the flight, on the website it tells me how many kilograms of CO2 the flight's gonna, gonna, gonna take. You'll probably go out for a meal tonight somewhere in Barcelona, and on the menu, you'll have all of a choice, and you'll have the number of calories that each meal has, and you can choose to, to pick one over the other. If you take that into the realm of a smart building, if I go up to the lift or the elevator in the building, and I know that it's gonna take so many kilowatt hours of electricity to bring me up two floors, but, this, but the, invite me to the stairs over here, would I take the stairs? Do you know, I probably would. In addition to that, ask the occupants for feedback on everything. Again, take Peer Work Sol, for example, Ask them about the small things and listen to the small things. Are they too hot? Are they too cold? Is that docking station really annoying them? Is it the toilet roll in the, in the, the, the lack of toilet roll in the toilets? Is it the coffee machine on the blink? Take that human feedback into the smart building data lake and give it to Swift HR to action quickly. We talk about the future of work, but we haven't changed our mentality or the teams who manage workplaces. We do see job titles now like Head of Workplace, Chief Workplace Officer, but are they empowered? Have they the say or control over facility man man management of a building once it's occupied? I don't believe so. And it's usually wrapped up in a third party contract anyway. I propose that those job performers are human, are HR centric, that they're head of the Swift HR team, and that we rewrite our facility management contracts to allow for spends on data-driven, proactive, and iterative improvements over the year. And a couple, of course, with larger capital projects that we may have to plan for next year because we, that end of the building really just doesn't work. And I suggest that the return on investment will be multiple the times of the investment. Couple this with empowering the people who give a shit, take the human information and normalizing it and analyzing it alongside the building data 
And now I think we're on to something. Swift HR, I would argue, is a new cross-functional team. Does it replace the siloed teams of all its members? Does it replace our traditional facility management teams? Yes, it should. We've talked to death about the future of work, but we're not reimagining how we manage these buildings. Swift HR will contain the specialities, but now they will get to see and understand their influence across the entire workplace, as the building and people dynamic are so well represented now at that smart building table. The most progressive companies I've met have real estate reporting in to HR and not finance. But let's take that a step further. We need to change. Every time I ask about HR at the smart building table, I'm told no. And you know, I, I, I ask it at events like this, panels uh, of my clients. I said, they're, not, they're really not interested, or that's not really how we work. But I don't believe that. That's a response resulting from how we currently manage buildings. Those who commission smart buildings, like real estate and FM, are not the ones that may not be the ones who can benefit the most from these insights. We've developed the technologies and the AI to monitor and serve up these insights. The sensors are there, we've coupled it with human feedback and sentiment. The data is there for the teams, but we just don't seem to have created the mechanism to use it. We need to continue that excitement that existed at the construction stage and bring it into the Swift HR team. Let them be the guides to show other departments how great an ROI impact they can have by making changes to the systems and professional services they manage. We have the technologies, guys. Let's use it.